Jobs, jobs. It's going to create jobs. That's why we should save the Earth jobs. Just watched a, uh, well, the first press conference for the Climate Crisis Task Force of Joe Biden's presidency. Joe Biden wants to make it all about jobs because that's the only way to apparently get the interest of industry and uh, people at large, those who don't pay attention to what's going on in the world or believe it's true or want to believe it's true or are promoting that it isn't. The is isn't in question is whether or not the climate, really the ecology in which we are embedded, is uh, changing. Which, we don't need to be advertised either way. We feel it, we're in it, we know it. The only thing you can be is reprogrammed out of caring about it. Nevertheless, there's that task force, there's John Kerry, there's Gina McCarthy, there's Gina McCarthy saying essentially that the titans of industry are eager to change things to help the environment because... At this point in history, it would be cheap to do. It would be on par with any of the conventional polluting stuff they tend to do. See, prior to now, it was cost prohibitive to try to save the Earth. To try to keep humanity chugging along here. But that's changed. Technology is uh, better, meaning cheaper, meaning probably of poorer quality so that it could be mass produced and become its own point of pollution. So the Titans of industry, they've, they've got uh, everything to gain and nothing to lose. This is the way she presented it. They don't have to do anything really. They don't have to change their lifestyle. Their, their so-called corporate culture. They just have to, you know what switch to led light bulbs and solar panels. As long as there's profit to be made and they don't have to do anything that makes them uncomfortable, billionaires will try to save us from extinction. That's the good news. If not, not. Then that's the bad news. Because people, you see, are not in their saving plan. Savings are. And this is the system we've all aided and abetted. We wait for billionaires to step off their perch and do something. And we say we're helpless to solve anything. And on we go, living in this system that we are a part of, that we create. Meanwhile, there ain't no one coming to save us, folks, as I've said a million times on this show. Probably less than that. <laughs> but it feels like that. It's up to us to save ourselves, which begins with the question, what about us is worth saving? I mean... Why do you want to be saved? Saved from what? Death? You're not going to be saved from death in the end. And right now, what your life is, is a multi-year project to save yourself from death. Which means, on the one hand, it's a multi-year project, your entire lifetime, in fact, of keeping you physically alive, but also of keeping you from the death of self, while the body remains alive. So you're keeping yourself intact. That's your life. That's what you do. And do you ever ask, who are you preserving? Do you even like that person? I mean, we keep seeing people who are afraid of death, but they don't like themselves. <laughs> they hate their lives. Uh, so, why is it that the fear of death outweighs the despising one's own life and yet, we don't do anything to significantly transform that life. So, who or what is it you're preserving? Aren't you preserving fear? Fear of death disguised as an individual? Have you ever thought about that, or just thought about all the poor animals we're killing? And the plants and the trees? Maybe your family, maybe you've got a newborn in your family that you've welcomed into the world, and, and you care about that baby. And that's why you want to save the world, save the planet. But if you cared about that baby, you'd change immediately. You wouldn't try to change the world back to something that is inhabitable to us. You would 
change the us that has made it uninhabitable in the first place. And that begins and ends with you, because you can't do anything about the body next to you claiming to be a person. And you are the world and the world is you, right? The old Krishnamurti adage. So, all you can change is you and that changes everything. Except you can't change you. The body, the brain, configuration of matter, bringing you the sense of personhood into the world has to hear this. Has to hear that that person, that thought construct, needs to go away now. If the body is to carry on. Because again, if you actually cared about the baby, cared about the newborn, cared about the animals and the plants and the trees, you would change immediately. If you cared about them beyond superficial feelings, you'd deeply feel them as you, and also you as you, and none of this would be a conversation, just action. Not reaction to what's going on out there in the world, the billionaires, the pollution, but action. Anyone can feel bad about something. Anyone can try to do something about it to not feel bad about it, which implies its opposite. Quitting. Because you can always quit trying when you get tired, or grow bored or get distracted because that trying was a reaction, not an action. Reacting, which is how we live our lives, is a strain. It takes energy. It involves thought, confusion, problem solving, which leads to more problems for you to solve. A never-ending cascade of problems for you to solve. Why? Because your thought. And you can't get there from here. You can't get to that solution through more of you when the problem is you. This is what you're anxious to preserve against death at all costs? Well, not all costs. I mean, if you're a billionaire, right, the cost had better not be financial. If you're of average or lesser financial means, the cost had better not be you. If you're a billionaire, it had better not be you, too. That's the final cost. And it's the first cost. Some of you put your lives on the line, your actual physical lives, to save a whale, rather than change the mind so that there is no discussion of saving or wasting, because the so-called new mind, it's not new, it's eternal, but that mind is not confused. It's not reacting. It's not controlled by thought. That mind is right action. It is nature. If you want to be the flow, man, stop being a water dam. Look, I made it into a little kid's rhyme for you. To stop being the dam, stop wanting it. And stop trying to do anything about it. Or with it. The dam breaks when the dam stops being a dam. Being a dam is your action, and that includes the action of trying not to be a dam. See? It all gets incorporated into your life. Your life is a dam. Hot dam. Just see this. It's all clear and obvious. So do nothing with it. Let the realization wash not over you, but wash you out. And when I say let, I'm talking to the brain. I'm not talking to you because, again, you're in the way. You're the dam. The brain is building you. So brain of listener, let the realization that the listener can't do anything about this and must dissolve for real change to be the case. Let that realization wash the listener away. What we call climate crisis isn't Earth reacting to you, though, even if you're in reaction. Earth has no doubt, so Earth isn't reacting. Earth has healthy action. Earth doesn't have confusion. If we're unhealthy, we may pull focus to what we're doing because that's part of health. And Earth responds with healthy action. And so if we experience that as a crisis, that tells us who we are, not the state that Earth is in. It tells us who and what we're trying desperately to preserve. Now, hearing this, you may feel depressed. It may make you sad. It may make you feel guilty. 
But look at what those things are. What are they? Those feelings. I mean, where do they come from? Where does depression and sadness and guilt come from? Don't they come from a state of perpetual helplessness? As if feeling those feelings is enough, or feeling those feelings is all you can do, so you just feel them, or you try to block them out. So how you feel becomes the thing that you're preserving once again. That's perpetual. How you are, who you are, is what you're constantly preserving. So if you are in denial, of course, of what you're doing to the world, as you are currently, uh, when you hear it reflected, it is offensive. And that offensiveness, if you internalize it, becomes depression, becomes guilt and sadness. And if you uh, reject it, you become hostile toward me. You get mad. Or you cut it off immediately because you don't want to hear it. These are the ways that we react through feeling so that we do nothing in the world except react. Because the doing, the changing of the doing, I should say, not you changing again, but the, the body taking action, doing away with the reactor, the nuclear reactor in this case, which is you. That's what must be done, and that's what it doesn't want to do. The you who is that sadness and that guilt and that anger. The you who strives to live. The you who seeks higher ground through spirituality. And probably physically at some point when, uh, you know, the seas rise. That you is the climate crisis. What can be done about you? I think it bears repeating because I don't think you've thought about it this way before. But when you see these images on TV of famine and poverty and uh, rising tides and people's homes getting washed away, polar bears trapped on a floating piece of ice, a chunk of ice that used to be its home when ice was not going extinct like the polar bear, when you see the inside of factory farming and all the gross, disgusting things that people have to do to slaughter animals in a factory so that fat people can get fat food at fast food restaurants to clog themselves up and kill themselves because that's what freedom has become. The freedom to poison yourself and your children. And call that freeing? Call that love? Call that human nature? When we see all of this, when we see all of this through a television set, or hear it through the radio, or see it in print, what we're seeing is us once removed. The product, if you will, of our reactions in the world through systems we've built or endorsed or just sat in, sat through, we see all of that is us once removed. So we don't have to internalize it except to feel something about it outwardly, to emote at it, to feel that sadness or, or whatever it is, you know, whatever it is we feel course some of us do internalize it and then we don't know what to do and we the, maybe we turn to drugs maybe we turn to video games maybe we turn to that fast food maybe we adopt way too many pets and we become crazy pet people with a thousand cats running around or dogs or whatever it is we try to hoard to save we become saviors really we become hoarders and when we do that, we force those animals to be like us, to be extensions of our reaction, of our failed systems in the form of civility, right? We must train them to live properly in our 
sphere of influence. They're as free as we are now, which is to say they're not free at all. But at least they're safe, right? They're saved from that cruel world of killers and corporatists. and Except not really, because they're not themselves anymore. And since we were never ourselves to begin with, and we're the quote-unquote dominant species, uh, we're, we're dragging the rest of the world with us. <laughs> Preceding our extinction will be everyone else's extinction. At least that's the way it looks. But of course, Earth being Earth, looks can be deceiving. The short term can look a certain way, but she's not on our timeline. The long term is if we were the ones gobbling up the world, uh, refuse to stop, refuse to transform into beings who do not gobble up the world, but live in balance with and as the world, then Earth restores balance. And of course, a lot of those species we've already destroyed. They've already gone extinct at our hands through logging and through fur trades and ivory trades and whatever trades, through building houses where their homes were, animals and trees and plants. Because we're free, right? We're free to do that. Got freedom on paper. And they're the paper. Those trees. So, those animals and those trees and those plants may not come back. But life goes on. The forms change. But the formless awareness behind those forms, through those forms, that is those forms... Uh, you know, mysteriously produces other forms. And we can view this as like a, an instantaneous physical transformation or evolution or however our westernized thinking makes sense of such a, an event. But if you pull out into timeless mode, really it's just the changing of colors as we perceive ourselves moving over them and through them. On a multicolored quilt. This age ends. Another age begins. We call that evolution. But it already exists. These are just colors. Colors on the fabric of reality. Now saying that has its appeal to people. Because a lot of people want to. Believe they're once removed. Just like the television. In spirituality we want to believe we're once removed. Just knowing that is enough. Knowing that there is a timelessness. And in that timelessness exists all time. And so us moving along in time is an illusion. And the real thing is the timelessness. Well, no, all of it is the real thing. And the what's important about it, the meaning, is who are you? Who are you moment to moment? Who are you right now in this climate crisis that is you? Well, you're you. And that's a problem. The problem for you. <laughs> Individually, it's a problem for you. Socially and globally, it becomes a problem for Earth, and that's why she must change her colors. Not like a chameleon hiding, but a transformation into something more beautiful. Some place where the self-identity of wholeness, once again, has the ability to blossom and flourish. That was our charge. That is our charge. But instead, we try to take charge. Err, do something about it. Form coalitions. Try to convince the captains of industry that this is good for their bottom line. It's at least just as inexpensive as, uh, you know, gas and oil. Look how cheap it is now to save everybody. Isn't that amazing? Let's do it. Let's get on this. We're on it. And you know what will be interesting about that is um, if, if the titans of industry truly do change their tune, that means they're not going to be uh, promoting that climate change isn't happening. They're going to be promoting that it is and that here we are to save the day. So what do you do with those tens of millions of tens of millions of tens of millions of people who bought into their garbage? 
Are they all of a sudden going to wake up and go, huh? Were we lied to all these years? Is climate change really happening? Probably not, because they're just going to move on to the next thing. Because again, climate change, climate crisis, was never the issue for them. That wasn't the thing they were in denial of. That's just a symptom. The thing they're in denial of is the necessity of waking up in the first place. And it's easier to be in denial of that when you have a Bible telling you uh, that ain't the way to go anyway. The way to go is just to believe in this Jesus over here. This dead earth, these hollow grounds, they're yours to stomp on. Animals are yours for the crushing. Women are yours for the enslaving. Don't even get me started on black and brown people. Red people? They don't even enter the conversation, do they? There's way too much guilt about that. The original sin of America. So much so that we'd rather argue about whether or not Indians were better off after 1492 than before. I see that same thing playing out here in Hawaii where, uh, you know, the sovereignty movement is a thing. And uh, you'll see white people online saying, and some Hawaiians agreeing with them. The Christianized Hawaiians will agree with them, as they've been trained to do, that uh, Hawaii is better off. Because what was going to happen anyway? Wasn't someone else just going to come along and conquer them? Conquer the islands? Conquer the people? Conquer, conquer, conquer? We tell ourselves whatever it takes to not feel bad. Or if we feel bad, if we feel guilty, we try to do something about it. And again... Both of those are ways for you to feel something, to react to that feeling, which is once removed from the actual issue, which is none of this would be an issue if you were living in right action, not reaction. If the you of the brain body didn't exist anymore. If thought itself understood its limitations and gave way to the limitless, instead of replicating the limitless through words like freedom. Being free isn't a kingdom. Freedom. The animal kingdom. Freedom. Our words indicate something, folks. They tell us how healthy we are. From the word go. Hey, wait, that's a word. So, yes. Earth is changing. Climate is transforming. Species are reforming their patterns of behavior. The flight of birds and the such. They call it adaptation. It's transformation. They've been trying to adapt to us, to accommodate us. Because we've left them no choice. This freedom we're talking about is our freedom only. But... All of that is short-sighted in the long expanse that Earth plays in. We can see that, mm, that these reformations to accommodate us only happen for so long. And then the big change happens. And when it happens, we'll be baffled, as we talked about in previous episodes. Where did this come from? And you're not going to survive it with guns. You're not going to survive it with freeze-dried ice cream in your, in your underground bunker, your safe room. There is no safe room from complete change. All of this is your safe room. As awful as it feels, that is your safe room. You're sustaining your sense of self, the strain against what is is what you would call a safe room. This sense of false autonomy. False individuality. You're a form representing a flux of consciousness in the form of thought. I know that's confusing, but that is what it is. And all of that is limited. And then there is the limitless, which is the consciousness in which all of these forms all of these streams of consciousness from whatever species 
dancing, playing, destroying, existing. And that's authentically you. That's what we talk about when we talk about the real, beyond the illusion or beyond the facade. There are several facades, all of them illusions, all of them thought. The individual, the archetype, the collective, the enigmatic other in the form of the paranormal. These are like dust in the breeze. And the breeze is the thing, and that thing is you. And there's no such thing as things. So it's actually movement, aliveness, impersonal love, truth. Not truths, impersonal truth. And impersonal, therefore, is more personal than personal. When it is truly you, it's not truly impersonal, it just means it's not a product of this so-called individual. The individual screaming crisis, not looking at themselves as the maker of said crisis. Making crises to solve them, to say that I am solving a problem, so I'm doing something right, so I'm a good person. I'm an alpha, or whatever it is. These are all childish reactions. In the end, we're still the terrible twos, personified. And those of us who care to are constantly trying to figure out how to grow up, how to mature. But unlike the analogy of the terrible twos or the metaphor of the terrible twos, there is no growing up. There is no maturing. There's total transformation in the blink of an eye. Or there's talking about it. 